James, we're live. How's it going? Not bad. Not bad, Griffin. Good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you too. Where are you uh, calling in from today? Uh, well, I'm actually uh, working fairly remotely. We've got a cabin up in uh, the Muskoka area in Canada, so we try to work from here when we're not in the office. So that's where I'm dialing in from today. Nice. Very cool. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to, to this conversation. Um, I want to give a little bit of background for, for people who haven't joined Behind the Future in the past. Um, we've also had a couple hundred people sign up for this event. Um, I think they're pretty eager to be hearing from you on your transformation journey and, and how enterprise architecture at, at Sheridan has been going. Um, but this, uh, this event is called Behind the Future. Um, and, and Behind the Future is RDoc's LinkedIn Live event. And I, I believe this is the 15th or, or 16th iteration. Um, <clears throat> so in this series, we sit down with IT professionals, enterprise architects, CIOs, et cetera, um, and, and ask them about their experience and their challenges within the industry. Um, the, the title, Behind the Future, asks the question, you know, what is the, the mechanism that is going to bring about the future of business or the future of enterprises? Um, and based off our experience with IT teams and, and enterprise architects, we've seen the, the tremendous value that um, business-focused EA can bring to organizations, um, especially if they're following this, this sort of new um, approach to EA that, that we're talking about. So um, before we hop into it, I'll just give a quick introduction and then curious to hear a quick introduction from you. My name is Griffin Schumacher. Um, I'm the head of sales for the Northeast region of uh, North America at RDoc. I've been here for coming up on four years and have worked with um, numerous teams on uh, standing up these sort of new business value oriented enterprise architecture practices. And um, I've been running this um, Behind the Future series in, in North America for around a year now. So um, that's me. What about you, James? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Griffin. Um, so yeah, I'm James Duncan. I'm the director of uh, Digital Transformation and Innovation at Sheridan College. Uh, so we're based in the Greater Toronto area. We've got a number of campuses in the, the west end of what's known as the, the Greater Toronto area. Um, so I've got a number of teams uh, that I work with that I'm really privileged to work with. Uh, obviously, the Enterprise Architecture team, and that's been you know, a particular focus, building out that practice over the last couple of years. Um, that's really going to be the crux of our conversation today. Uh, but I also work with a number of other teams. I work with our project management office and uh, our data governance team as well as our enterprise systems team that looks after our kind of all our core enterprise applications. So I've been in the, the higher education space for 20 years and we're going to talk, I think quite a bit about that, you know, the, uh, the, the trials and tribulations of working inside higher education and, you know, in that industry for a long period of time. So look forward to the conversation. Yeah, me too. Thanks for that um, background. I think working in EA is challenging, but working in EA, at, you know, at a university has its own set of challenges. So I'm certainly excited to talk about that with you today. Um, the topic for our conversation is, can EAs really drive change? I think what we're really going to get into is how you can build broad-based support for enterprise architecture or digital transformation um, at uh, different organizations. So I'm um, excited to, to hear about that today. Um, so the first thing I wanted to ask you is, um, you know, I don't think many middle schoolers or children um, are, are um, you know, sitting around and fantasizing about becoming directors of, of digital transformation. So how did you find yourself in the digital transformation or enterprise architecture space um, today? Well, I think the answer to that is probably a, a bit of a me answer and a bit of a, a shared an answer. So, you know, a number of years ago, we'd started a, um, a digital transformation initiative in the organization. So we started embarking on, um, you know, we put aside some funding, we put aside some some intention and some resources to, you know, transforming certain aspects of the organization digitally. And, you know, we did this pre-pandemic. So, I mean, obviously, and we'll talk a little bit about the, the inflection point of the pandemic as well, but, you know, we'd done that with intentionality, you know, that we wanted to transform certain aspects of the organization. We started with a PMO. Um, so, our, you know, our original kind of foray into digital transformation was, you know, how do we take all of these initiatives that, you know, will transform aspects of the business, you know, enable, you know, things better through technology and how do we bring them through to execution and how do we do that successfully? And, you know, we had really good success in that, that kind of quadrant, you know, I think from a, you know, varying degrees, you know, we, we saw a lot of success, the projects we were moving forward, we were getting things done well. Um, we kind of hit an inflection point, and this was actually just before the pandemic, where 
you know, we were sitting around a table, you know, a number of uh, folks at the IT table and, you know, certainly from, you know, executive conversations of, you know, coming to this realization that we're doing things well, we're doing things the right way, but we're not sure that we're doing the right things. And, you know, that was kind of the, you know, the, I think the kind of point of realization that we were missing some side of the, the digital transformation puzzle. So we started talking a lot about, you know, what that would look like, you know, how do we fit that piece into the, you know, the overall part of the organizational puzzle. And that kind of went hand in hand with, um, you know, a larger institutional push to, you know, become a little more purposefully uh, kind of a planning culture. You know, so we'd started on, you know, we were at that point, we we're fairly early into our, you know, kind of most recent kind of uh, five-year multi-year plan. You know, there was specific aspects of that strategic plan that talked about the the need for people-centric technology as enabler uh, for the organization. And, you know, all of the things that the Strat plan kind of outlined and all of what we were seeing in our our successes in project management implied that we we weren't sure that we were kind of going down the right path. We were being very reactive. You know, we were taking projects that were coming into the organization from the business. We were bringing them through to successful completion. We weren't sure if we were investing in the right ways. Um, so again, sitting down, having this conversation around um, what piece of the puzzle would fix that and started talking a lot about enterprise architecture, you know, as a piece that's missing. And, you know, I'd say we were very good on the solution side of things, solution architecture, and you know, we had a pretty good practice in the, in the PMO. Um, what we're missing is this kind of, you know, overall kind of alignment of business architecture, data architecture with the technology uh, architecture and saying, here's the area where the organization needs the most investment. Here's where the alignment makes sense. And it doesn't as, as parts of the business are putting things forward. And how do we kind of purposely help steer that conversation? So, you know, that was where the, the driver for EA came from. And then, of course, the ask came across of, uh, you know, how are we actually going to staff this thing up? And, you know, my yeah. own career path was very much on the IT side of things. I came out of the infrastructure side, kind of working my way up as a systems and solution architect up to, you know, kind of leading our, our infrastructure practice. And I'd had some background, obviously, in solution architecture and in TOGAP and business process improvement, a number of things that all kind of fit the VA the puzzle. And we kind of thought about the mix of um, we could go outside the organization, look for somebody that, you know, is kind of a, um, you know, a historical kind of VA practitioner that would come in and would have to learn likely higher education and certainly Sheridan. Or, you know, do we try to bring somebody in from the outside that has the, you know, the mix of experience and, and relationships inside Sheridan? I think that was the, you know, we realized for EA to really be successful, you know, those relationships were key. Uh, and that's mm -hmm. where we kind of made the prioritization. We really want to find somebody inside and that's, that's when I was kind of asked to kind of step aside and start building that practice out. Yeah. I love that um, terminology, you know, are we doing the right things? I don't think that's something that people outside of EA associate um, with enterprise architecture, this sort of strategic view, but I think that's exactly what a successful, you know, business value focused enterprise architecture practice can bring the sort of strategic lens and um, bridging the gap between IT and business. I'm curious, was there, um, was there a history of EA at Sheridan or, or who, who was it that sort of said, Hey, we need EA and, and James, you're the guy to do it. Yeah. You know, this, there had been no prior history of EA. You know, I, you know, I'm certainly aware from you know, discussions with colleagues in a number of organizations have gone through building and rebuilding EA practices. That wasn't our case. I mean, this was entirely Greenfield. This is our first foray into mm into enterprise architecture. Um, like I say, you know, I think we had some some good practices in the solution architecture space. Um, you know, so there we had some kind of experience to draw on, but you know, that for us was the key differentiator. It's not so much of making sure the solutions are well aligned to the requirements and the needs of the organization. It's making sure we're doing the right things and how do we, how do we get a view of the bigger picture? Um, yeah. So, you know, as we were going through those conversations, it was the, the CIO at the time, the associate vice president of IT that kind of pulled us aside and said, this is a direction we need to go. We're going to support this with a, an organizational realignment. And you know, James, we'd like you to, you know, kind of step aside and take on the, the task over the next couple of years of building out this practice. So kind of went from managing a, you know, a team with a fairly big portfolio and a number of people to, you know, at the start, and we'll talk about how we grew the practice, but, you know, it was a team of one to begin with. And we've, we've grown that over time. Nice. So, so you've been tapped on the shoulder to, to spin up this EA team. Um, how did you go about building support, uh, building institutional buy-in for what enterprise architecture um, could provide to Sheridan College? 
You know, I think the first question we tried to answer is, is you know, you got to start with why, you know, why is this the right thing for Sheridan? And, you know, I think there was a, you know, there was a good number of conversations at the beginning where we really tried to answer the question of why and, um, you know, had to be accept what the answer would come back as. So a lot of, a lot of the early work was frankly just, you know, it was, I want to say public relations, but it's certainly a lot of communication. It was a lot of conversation. Um, I spent quite a lot of time in the, you know, the first few months in the role of just really doing a roadshow, you know, just kind of active, active listening kind of conversations, asking people what their um, current challenges are, you know, not just with technology, you know, trying to socialize the bigger aspect of, of enterprise architecture, how it encompasses people, process technology elements, not just the, the tech side, because we knew that would be a, you know, perceptual thing that we try to have to overcome. Um, asking people, you know, what does success look like for their area and what's kind of, what, what are the barriers to that, you know, from, a, you know, different perspectives. And out of all of those conversations, you know, try to bring, draw, draw back what, you know, where could we, you know, create some value in the organization? Like we had this, you know, abstract notion as we created the role and we created the team that enterprise architecture was needed, but it's a far cry from saying there's a void here and we think something can fill it to actually designing an EA practice and saying, here's the, the right mix of services that we need to provide to the organization. So, you know, a lot of that kind of more detailed discussion was, you know, through that kind of roadshow function, those conversations uh, with different areas of the business, right from our, what we call our PVP or president, vice president council, right down to, you know, the individual business units and the challenges that they were experiencing. So, you know, most folks that have gone through developing or kind of restarting an EA practice will recognize EA can be a lot of things to, to different organizations. You know, some organizations are more solution focused. Some people are more, you know, strategy focused and, you know, the gamut, the spectrum runs in between. So that was a question we had to answer really early on, you know, as a core value proposition, what services could we offer the organization that would add value and wouldn't you know, create the perception of, um, you know, additional structure or rigor or red tape or anything like that. So it was very much a value-based mm -hmm. conversation. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. And um, I'm sure there are different um, personalities, but also values and sort of um, focus areas for different types of people at a university. Can you talk a little bit about how you tailored this roadshow or these meetings um, for, for different audiences across Sheridan College? Yeah, I mean, I think the roadshow was, you know, fairly consistent that the message we heard, you know, from different areas of the business was was different. Um, you know, and I'll say from a from an industry perspective, you know, enterprise architecture is not necessarily common. You know, we certainly find mm -hmm. practitioners of EA across different higher ed organizations, but I wouldn't say it's the rule. You know, it's probably more the exception still at this stage. Um, but I don't want to make too many presuppositions about why what why that might be. But I think we could certainly say one thing is that, um, you know, it's really two organizations in one in a lot of ways. There's very different cultural aspects to, you know, the academic side of the organization and the mission that they have, and then the administrative side of the organization that supports that. So, you know, in the conversations we had, you know, as we were going around the organization, you know, the, the roadshow listening tour that I was on, it was, you know, we realized very quickly the value proposition was different to different sides of the organization. You know, messages around the value proposition of enterprise architecture as an enabler for, you know, greater efficiencies and, you know, things like that, that resonated on the administrative side of the organization, whereas very much on the academic side of the organization, you know, they are, they're the side of the organization that has the, um, you know, the perspective of, you know, here's the mission that we're on as an organization. We're not a commercial entity. We're not here as, from a profit motive perspective. We exist because we create and disseminate knowledge. And, you know, with that view and that vision comes a lot of kind of big picture, blue sky thinking, what if, you know, it's very unconstrained and it's, it's unstructured in a lot of ways. So, you know, the conversation around where we could out, add value to that side of the organization was very different than the conversation of where we add value to the other. Um, and that's not a, you know, kind of one side versus the other um, kind of conversation. It was just a realization very early on that it, to be successful, we would have to tailor our services differently for you know, the different aspects of the organization. Mm -hmm. I think it's so interesting that you called it a listening tour as opposed to, you know, like an educational tour. How much of those meetings were you taking input from them and factoring that into your plan for EA versus saying, hey, here's what we're going to do with our enterprise architecture team? Well, you know, I think the, the one thing I was being really cognizant of right at the beginning is that we sat in a dark room somewhere and came out with a, 
you know, here's our, you know, kind of narrow view of what EA should be. And now we're going to sell that to the organization. We probably wouldn't be successful. Um, so, you know, the listening tour was key. I mean, we certainly did follow that on with a, you know, kind of subsequent discussions around, you know, this is what we've heard and this is the direction we think we're striking out on and making sure that resonates. Um, so it was very important that we did that as well. I mean, there was an education piece that came subsequently, but, um, you know, there is a reputation of enterprise architecture. And again, not necessarily in our organization because it didn't exist, but there can be perceptual challenges of EA that, you know, it's a, an ivory tower kind of practice. You know, it's a, a bunch of folks, you know, kind of sitting off to the side, um, you know, thinking about things more conceptually than practically, and then coming up with, you know, strategies and plans and roadmaps and things like that, that are a little divorced from reality. And that's, that's exactly the barrier that we wanted to, you know, overcome. That's the perception we didn't want to have. We wanted to be very, very practical in our approach. We wanted to be very um, federated. We wanted to enable the organization not to, you know, try to lead them. So, you know, it became a, a question very long again, you know, the two sides of the organization, but where we can, where we can add value and how we support that. And then, you know, coming up with this vision, this, this charter, uh, it was kind of the, the driving document uh, at the end of that kind of visioning process of, you know, here's what EA will be in its first iterations at Sheridan. This is where we're going to start from. These are the services we provide. And then, you know, of course, then became the, the educational piece, the kind of public relations piece, even of just, you know, advertising ourselves, making sure that we were, we were known as an entity around the, the institution that, you know, there were services that we provided that people could consume and use. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think often we speak to a lot of EA teams and something you see a lot in the industry is EA can kind of suffer the cycle of, of funding and defunding. Um, especially if those teams are, you know, what we refer to in a loving manner as old EA teams, ones that are kind of divorced from business value or, or divorced, divorced from um, providing, uh, you know, tangible um, value to an organization. Um, and in some places it's gotten so bad that even the, the name enterprise architecture has a, has a negative connotation. Was that ever part of your guys' conversation? You know, should we be calling this EA? Should we call it something else? And where did you guys settle? I mean, we did settle by calling ourselves enterprise architecture. And I think we did that in large part because we weren't trying to overcome the hurdle of, um, you know, any kind of prior kind of uh, reputational issues like some organizations have had. Um, mm -hmm. If we were restarting practice, we might've gone a different direction, but we did have a conversation, you know, very early on about, you know, what do we call this? You know, we saw this as a subset of our digital transformation practice. Um, you know, we had purposely kind of branded our, our PPMO as, uh, you know, with a, a cutesy kind of code name. We called it Project Springboard. It was the springboard to launch projects mm. uh, successfully into the organization. So, you know, we did kind of exercises of, you know, branding, you know, how are we going to launch, you know, this side of the digital transformation initiative? Will we, will we call it by its, you know, its kind of name, you know, just call it as it is, it's enterprise architecture, or will we call it something else? And did a bit of ideation around that and decided that the, at the end of the day, for better and worse, let's call it as it is, it's enterprise architecture, and we'll socialize what that means for the organization and, do our own internal work to brand, you know, what that, that means in terms of our value and our services. Yeah. Uh, that, that makes sense. Um, one, uh, another question on the roadshow, how, how did you reach out to people? Did you just say, Hey, we want to have a sit down with you because we're thinking of spinning up this team as it relates to digital transformation or um, what did that outreach look like? And how did you get people intrigued enough to be willing to give you information that you needed to then in turn, you know, provide value? I mean, we're, I mean, we're relatively, you know, fairly large organization, you know, certainly for higher ed. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think we, we certainly realized, you know, up front that we were going to have to um, focus our energies, you know, where we thought we would have the most value. So, I mean, one of the first things we did was like a stakeholder mapping exercise, you know, just looking across the organization, where do we think, you know, people have the most interest or, uh, you know, concern or, you know, whatever about, you know, the practice that we're introducing here, because it is purposeful change. And, you know, we did, you know, eventually have, you know, kind of a change management plan that went around with, with enterprise architecture. But, you know, at the very beginning, it was kind of, you know, where do we pick our battles? And there were very, you know, kind of you know, substantive conversations around um, here's where we think we can offer the most value and, the you know, the most value quickly and, you know, start the conversations there. Um, but certainly, you know, a lot of the stakeholder mapping kind of called out, here's the areas where we think we need to be most integrated, you know, and they were certainly areas where there's a lot of autonomy and independent decision making. And we thought, you know, we could add some value in enabling them with good data and information to make better decisions going forward. Um, mm. There are parts of the organization where we knew we'd play a much more active role. 
um, you know, some of the technology units that are distributed around the organization because higher education tends to be fairly decentralized. So, you know, that's a whole other conversation, federated versus centralized DA. And, you know, we made the decision early on that we weren't trying to be the you know, centralized kind of gatekeeper approach. Um, so, you know, went through that stakeholder mapping exercise, the, the value proposition or the, um, the interest that each stakeholder had and where we thought we'd start our energy. So, you know, we, we tried to strike a balance of, you know, conversations with the academic units and, you know, the structures that support them, the administrative side of the organization. And, you know, what we heard a lot of that was the, um, you know, the differing viewpoints, the different, uh, you know, ideas of um, how EA could add value, uh, different parts of the organization learned very quickly that we needed to tune our messaging or even our, our phrasing, our, you know, our verbiage and everything to, to different parts of the organization based on their interests and their, you know, their particular culture. Because again, it's not a, you know, it's not a judgment in any way. I think it's just the unique nuance of higher education that, you know, there's very different cultures on different sides of the organization to support both of them effectively. We had to tailor our approach quite a bit. Mm. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I just wanted to quickly for, for people who've tuned in, feel free to um, write any questions or comments in the chat area and we'll actually dedicate some time at the end and, and have um, James answer some, some questions there. I think there's, there's a few, but um, feel free to, to write in with anything else. Um, so I'm curious, you've, you've, um, you finished this sort of roadshow, this interview process. And I, I, I love to hear that because I do think a lot of EA teams um, are spun up and then they, they, they do sit in their corner and say, here's what we're going to do. But really the approach that we advocate for is finding that niche within the organization where you can provide the most value. And the key to that is, is talking to people, bringing people into the architecture process. So after having gathered some of that information um, and having finished the roadshow, what was your step number one? You have all this information and, and, and all these ideas, but what was the, the first thing that you, that you did? I mean, the first thing we had to do is we, I mean, we created a formal charter. I mean, that was something that the institution, you know, agreed to and approved that, you know, this is the practice. These are the services that it creates. This is where it sits in the, the organizational structure, the capabilities it provides and, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, that was really job one. Um, job two, you know, having defined that really became, you know, how do we build that practice out? You know, it's one thing to kind of sit hypothetically and say, this is a service we can offer. It's recognizing resources need to be devoted towards that. So, you know, kind of the, the first step after the, you know, the listening tour and all of the conversations institutionally was, you know, this is what enterprise architecture, you know, could or should look like for Sheridan. Um, how are we going to go about that? You know, so the game, then the, the exercise of figuring out where we can, where we can add value quickly and how do we build towards the, uh, you know, the longer term value kind of iteratively. And again, that's a conversation we had a lot of, you know, cause we had some significant long-term aspirations. You know, we, we are still, you know, having really good conversations with our strategic planning team about our next strategic plan and how, you know, our, our enterprise architecture frameworks and constructs and team can support that. That's a multi-year kind of uh, initiative. Um, we recognize really quickly as a new team, we've got to show value really, really quickly as well. So, I mean, the, you know, the first, first order was really kind of developing the roles and responsibilities of the team, how we would exist as part of a, like a more federated approach DA in the organization where we would you know take on some work specifically and what those those positions would look like and then building the business case and and hiring those folks i mean the the ramp was you know fairly long and i'm i'm grateful that there was some um allowance for that organizationally but you know given about a year in or something you know we had a, a good kind of solid core team in place and we were starting to um you know put some of the the work and the practices in place i mean we focused early on on you know some quick wins like you know everybody else does um, you know, where can we add value quickly? And, you know, there were some things that we did and I kind of alluded to this earlier, like we started the A practice right at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, you know, mm -hmm. we actually had a pause point where we kind of said, is this still the right time to do this? Um, you know, we'd had the conversations leading up to the pandemic about whether or not um, EA was the right thing to do. And we had this agreement that it would be, and we were just about to kind of kick off the process. And of course, COVID happened and just upended everything. And, you know, very quickly had a conversation around, is this the right time to do this? Should we pause? And then we realized this is truly, you know, this is an inflection point for digital transformation. Right. Our entire business model was upended overnight. You know, we went from an institution that was predominantly in, you know, brick and mortar teaching and learning, like, you know, students on campus in a classroom, you know, learning from an instructor in a physical space to, we had to do everything virtually. 
So, you know, we realized at that point, that's, you know, that's not the point to pause. That's the point to accelerate. Um, so thankfully right. we moved forward and, you know, we had to decide very early on where do we add value, you know, quickly was, um, you know, this was imposed upon us, you know, this whole change in business model. It's not the way we would have gone about it. And I don't think anybody would have, but um, are we positioned well to, um, to ride through that wave of COVID, you know, and how do we differentiate ourselves as an organization? So, you know, we did some early exercise, just like even with our enterprise risk team, technology risk assessments, and not just the technology, but all the people in process associated with the technology, because our entire model had been built on the idea that technology augmented, you know, a classroom experience. Well, now technology was the classroom experience. Mm. So, you know, going, going through the exercise, even of just, you know, assessing and analyzing our readiness for supporting that and where business process changes might be needed or where we had, you know, particular weakness and organizational structure, or, you know, some of the roles that we had in place. And yes, of course, you know, the technology components that may have needed some change in investment, you know, that was a very early win. Um, other early wins as well were, you know, things like putting in place just, you know, some lightweight governance for solution architecture to make sure that, you know, we set out some standards and some principles and that as projects kind of went through the process, you know, we made sure there was good alignment and we weren't exacerbating some of the, the challenges that we knew that led up to the, the need for enterprise architecture. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. I was just um, chatting with another uh, CIO yesterday who shared that, you know, they went from 98% desktop machines to 98% laptop machines. And that was just a, yeah. a change that was necessitated overnight. Um, and you absolutely need, you know, uh, some sort of centralized IT planning or an enterprise architecture team to, to guide an organization like that through as big of a step change as COVID was for us. So I think we've certainly seen that in the industry as well. COVID has drived um, a lot of um, focus and attention on enterprise architecture as a team that can help enable the, the change that was necessitated. So um, that's... Um, that's not surprising to me. Um, I think the other thing that you also said that stuck out to me was the need for EA teams to prove value quickly. Um, mm -hmm. Something that we have seen, and, and I think something that we see, especially in like these older EA teams, is um, what we call death by repository. So they spin up an mm -hmm. EA team, and then they 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 spend, you know, they they start on this um, this uh, you know endless task of cataloging everything. And the reality is you're never going to get there. You're never going to be able to actually map out the entire enterprise as it exists. And if you do, well, guess what? It's tomorrow. It's going to be different. And so, so I think um, I literally like what you said around, you know, just ensuring that you're providing it quickly kind of regardless of, um, of the, the data set that is uh, that you have in place. Um, I'm yeah, curious that, just in like specific. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go on. Yeah, no, I was going to say, because that's a very active conversation we had. I mean, we knew we needed a repository of, you know, the current state of the organization to help, you know, guide decisions, you know, going forward. But, you know, we we were really purposeful. We kind of allowed ourselves, this is our ramp up to the current state architecture. What we really want to be, you know, the mix of our services going forward is really future state conversation. You know, I, mm -hmm. I think we would consider it a failure of our practice if we spent, you know, the majority, like 90% of our time just trying to document the current state of everything what we wanted to be able to do is help, you know, take that information and enable conversations of where, where the organization could be going forward, whether it's our, the right mix of investment into our applications, whether it's business process improvement or, you know, business capability, yeah. you know, capability-based planning, you know, those frameworks were the, the kind of key and the focus going forward. And, you know, for us, I think the, the real measure of success early on was, I think, you know, for the first few months, you know, it was this active thing of trying to insert ourselves into the right conversations. And, you know, I think every, Every unit that's new to an organization probably goes through that phase of, hey, we're here and we can add value and let us help. Um, you know, we very quickly kind of get to a, got to a stage of realizing we're a group with fairly limited resources and we need to pivot a little bit. We need to pick and choose where we where we invest because people are approaching us beyond our capacity. So, you know, it's kind of driven us to be, again, that kind of more modern EA organization where we can enable good decision making. We don't have to be the the gatekeepers. You know, we we have people that approach us to help guide their their decisions, their conversations, you know, around projects and initiatives and planning and things like that. And, you know, we're in a good healthy spot. I think we're in some cases we're, we're having to pick and choose our engagement. Yeah. Yeah. So I think one of my colleagues like to say is, is, um, you know, we want EA teams to be the team of, of no, like we know this KNOW versus the team of no and no. And I think a lot of these older EA teams are those teams that say, no, you can't do this. You can't buy that software. We have this, but 
ideally EA team should be the source of information that, that help people make strategic decisions. Um, just because I, I, I bet people are wondering, I, I kind of want to get into some of the tactical stuff. Um, are you, you know, you mentioned capability uh, based planning and also some governance. Can you share some of the, the deliverables or outputs that your architecture team is, is focused on in the near term? Yeah, I mean, for from a governance perspective, I mean, we we establish as most do, like an architecture review board, um, you know, that looks at you know the work in the projects, make sure there's good alignment, and publish the processes and the policies, the standards around all of that. Um, you know, that that for me was a quick win. You know, that was kind of a requirement, but that's not where we wanted to be focused. We, we didn't want to be a, a governance centric EA. You know, again, we didn't want to be mm -hmm. the the people of no, no, this isn't the right way to do this, or no, you can't do that. Um, we wanted to help right. guide people, you know, kind of through the process. So, you know, we did start with that. You know, I think that was a that was a near term kind of thing, um, but you know we realized quickly on you know in the conversations we had with different areas of the college and one key one was around our strategic planning and the way we do our annual planning. Um, you know we have a we have a multi year strategic plan that is um, very aspirational. You know it's definitely the the strategic plan you would publish to you know the broader world to say this is what Sheridan is and this is what we do and this is our mission and our values. Um, behind the scenes, it's a little harder to kind of align to to the, the way it's structured and say, okay, this is how we can, these are the right mix of investments, you know, things that have strong and weak alignment. So we've had really good conversation there about how we bring capability-based planning into that process, how do we bring some, a little more structure, a little more rigor to a process that's fairly loose and the right balance, the right mix of, of ways for the organization. So, you know, that that's still an ongoing conversation in a lot of ways because we're now ramping up quickly into our, our next strategic planning process and we're you know, we are partnering with the, you know, the area that does that strategic planning to kind of work, move forward and say, this is what the structure of the next strategic plan could look like. Again, the aspirational in front and the, you know, the kind of structured, you know, kind of view of things in the, in the back end. Yeah. Um, one last question for you. And then I want to turn to the audience questions. Um, has it been uh, something we had talked about previously was just the, the complexity inherent in a, an organization as big as, as Sheridan. What, uh, has it been daunting getting a sense of what that's like or uh, how have you communicated that outside of, um, out of your team? Yeah, it is big and it is complex. And, you know, I'd say in a lot of ways, um, yeah, higher education is probably about the most complex, you know, organization you could probably start enterprise architecture in, um, you know, so it's been a good challenge in a lot of ways, um, because again, you know, whether it's cultural, you've got the different aspects of the organization, you've got the, you know, certain precepts that are, you know, fundamental to the success of higher education, like academic freedom of speech, you know, just this notion mm -hmm. that different areas of the organization have their own uh, autonomy to drive their curriculum, you know, what needs to support that and things like that. So we knew we, you know, we couldn't be a top-down kind of EA structure. We had to be an enabling structure. Um, so, you know, understanding that complexity, again, is that balance of how much of the current state do we model versus how much do we we have the right level of information to help people, you know, drive decisions. And, you know, we're not trying to force ourselves into those conversations, you know, for the most part. You know, I think we're, we're being asked to, to help guide people. And, you know, I think we've just, we've naturally come to the conclusion, you know, there are certain things we have to let go of. You know, we can't, you know, we can't, we can't smooth out every aspect of complexity in an organization this big. I mean, it's just, it's chaos in the best sense of the word. You know, innovation kind of happens at the nexus of planning and chaos, you know, and, you know, to structure yeah. some aspects too much, it takes away the innovation, takes away the, the chaos that lends itself to, you know, the organization progressing forward. And again, I think that's, that's key and central to higher education as an industry. Um, versus, you know, a certain level of data, a certain level of information, a certain level of rigor, you know, at the right stage can, can lend itself to making better decisions. So, you know, that's always the balancing act we're trying to strive. And, you know, I don't think we'll ever fully tame the complexity of the organization, nor do we intend to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Let, letting a little bit of complexity live to, to drive innovation. I think that's really interesting. Um, cool. Well, we had a few questions come in uh, from the audience. Um, so let me, um, I want to ask you one, and, and I think, I do think we kind of covered this, but I'm curious to to get your thoughts on it. How was the funding of the EA initiative handled? Um, was that, did that happen before the roadshow? Was roadshow part of that? Yeah, walk us through the, the funding process. Well, I mean, it was progressive. So, I mean, at the start, it was very much of a, um, again, a team of one. 
So we, we restructured IT and kind of set aside my my leadership role as this will be the head of the EA unit. So we already had you know the funding for my position. We realigned the rest of the the IT leadership structure to support that. Um, then it became this progressive thing of you know rationalizing you know kind of through business case you know this is what we need to be successful. So I mean of course the listening to and all the you know the things that informed our charter and how we had to go about. And then it became this conversation of you know, we need certain tooling, we need certain positions, we need certain, you know, things to happen, you know, outside engagements to some degree as well, um, that all required a degree of investment and funding. So we went through the same process that anybody in the organization goes through to rationalize why that would be, you know, the, a good investment for Sheridan. So, you know, some of that came aside from the, you know, we put it aside a pot of money for digital transformation. Again, that project springboard, that springboard initiative, you know, had some money put aside. Mm -hmm. So, some of the funding came out of that and some of it was kind of, uh, you know, say we had to kind of sing for our supper in a lot of ways. We had to build the case for it. And in some cases, the roles started contract and we built successfully to, you know, converting them into full-time roles. So it was, it was not a one and done kind of thing. It was a continuing conversation of, you know, this is the roadmap. We had this sense of EA 1.0, 2.0, and at the different stages where we thought we would need investment. Um, so we kind of, as we hit each of those kind of milestones and that, that overall kind of EA roadmap, we had to, you know, we had to build the case for why the investment was, was worthy. Yeah. And are you, for each of those investment stages, are you providing like a corresponding ROI or, or, Hey, this is, this is what EA could save the organization. Yeah. I mean, we're not as, again, a profit motive isn't as strong in the organization, but certainly, you know, from a, a fiscal perspective, you know, we're, we try to be as responsible as possible. So. You know, there are certain things where we, you know, it's very much a value conversation. You know, these roles or this structure of team will be able to do this for the organization. You know, there are certain aspects of certain programs we wanted to put in place, like application portfolio management and things like that, where there was an investment in people, there was an investing in tooling, but there was a return on that investment. And we did quantify that as part of the business case. So, you know, when we got to the stage where we needed discrete investments that had a return on investment, we definitely, definitely called that out. That was part of the pitch of how we went about things. Yeah. Got it. That makes sense. Um, another one from the audience here. What are the tools or methods that you have um, to be able to quickly ramp up on business capabilities? Um, so I guess, did you leverage existing models? Um, did you store them somewhere that allowed you to easily share them? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, so I think we're talking about business capabilities there. So I mean, in that particular space, I mean, we, we definitely didn't want to start from a blank page. We didn't want us to, um, you know, reinvent a wheel. I mean, there's really good frameworks out there and we've borrowed from a lot of them. And, you know, I'll be the first to say I'm not a, I'm not a huge pro proponent of, you know, frameworks like TOGAF or things like that, adopting that wholesale, you know, that's very process driven EA, but there were certain aspects mm -hmm. of that, you know, certain, you know, pieces of, of a overall meta model for how we structure our, our information or, certain processes, you know, from a governance structure that we borrowed. When it came to business capabilities, you know, there is a, a an industry model for higher education that we started from. Uh, it's known as the CODIT model, and it's um, it's shared through an organization in North America called Educause. So, I mean, that became our kind of leaping off point to look at, okay, here's a, here's a general kind of, you know, practice of how capabilities are designed, uh, you know, distributed across higher education. Now we can go through the process of tailoring that to the uniqueness of Sheridan. And those are the pieces mm -hmm. that we're lining back to our, our planning processes. Yeah, we've run into quite a few teams using this CODIT model, but I think that's the the key is uh, starting with something so you can start to have the conversations around, mm -hmm. hey, what, how should this look for us? How can we tweak this to make sure that's resonating with our counterparts um, at this organization? Because no, no two organizations are the same. So if you just use an industry one, flat out with no changes, you're going to have a hard time, I think, having necessary conversations. Yeah, it's kind of a consultant's answer. And I, you know, that's how we try to position ourselves as interning, an internal consulting organization. But, you know, our own internal conversations around where do we start of the value and benefit of starting from a blank page, you know, the organization will then feel this deep investment into the capability model and the fact that it does mm. accurately represent everything that Sheridan does versus you know, starting from an industry model that doesn't necessarily have a lot of resonance. Some of the terminology isn't, you know, how we kind of, you know, put things from a shared perspective, you know, the consulting right. answer is it was in the middle, it was in the middle somewhere, you know, we struck the balance <laughs> of the two approaches. We, we tailored the model. Yeah. Yeah. And 
the reason you use a capability model is to have conversations with people outside of IT or inside IT. Um, but and so if you're if there's language in there that they're not familiar with, you're you're missing the point. And so those models have to be pretty specifically tailored to. Um, and we've even worked with teams who basically have sit downs and they say, hey, we're thinking of calling it this. What do you guys call it? Where can we meet so that this model will actually help drive um, drug change? Mm -hmm. Okay, so one more question and then I think we have to wrap up. But I, I think this one's kind of topical. Curious to hear your thoughts. Considering the AI revolution, do you think there's gonna be any change in, in um, what's required of EA or how EA functions? Ooh, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a, um, that's a heavy one. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would say from a, an AI perspective, I mean, certainly we're grappling as an industry of, you know, what it's going to mean for, you know, higher education. I think most people do. Um, you know, you look at the rise of things like chat GPT and things like that it has, you know, very significant impact on things like academic integrity. You know, how do you measure mm -hmm. now accurately the, you know, the learning that a student is doing and give them, you know, good kind of, you know, feedback around their learning progress. From an enterprise architecture perspective, is it going to have an impact? Of course, you know, I think at the end of the day, anything that is um, rules-based, you know, is is going to be subject to automation. And, you know, in some aspects, you know, EA is rules-based. In some cases, it's looser. You know, it requires quite a lot of interpretation. And there's as much an art as a science to, to, to EA. But there are certainly going to be components of, you know, as you develop a very structured, you know, kind of model of the organization, whether it's current state or future state, you know, that data is so well-structured that, of course, you know, artificial intelligence is going to augment, um, you know, the practice of enterprise architecture. We're probably not too far off from having, you know, uh, systems and models that populate themselves. Here's the current states and, you know, an AI engine, whether it's, you know, conversational or, or not that you can query and say, what if, you know, what could Sheridan look like if, you know, kind of thing and present back, okay, here's, here's the process changes. Here's the technology changes that would get you from A to B. Um, you know, I, I think AI is like anything else. It, it's not, you know, it will replace some roles. It'll change others, uh, but it's a tool. And the people that wield it effectively are, are going to be much more successful than the people that don't. So um, certainly not scared by the advent of AI. I think it's an opportunity more than anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well said. And I, I think it even, I think it will push EA teams to do more of what you're doing, you know, architecture and transformation is successful when you're involving people, right? And you're doing things like this listening tour. Um, once you get the, the information you need and, and you can sort of align yourselves with the goals of the organization, that's when you can really provide um, impactful change. And I, I do think AI in whatever form it will take can help there, but I don't think it'll be the, the, the you know, the doer, so to say. It'll be the, in a lot of ways, it'll be the accelerant for what I think, you know, a lot of us already recognize as the trend in enterprise architecture, which is, you know, the old school EA of, you know, you've got a bunch of smart folks in a, in a room somewhere that lock all the knowledge up in terms of how the organization functions and, you know, how things could change going forward to where it is today is, is it's an enabler. You know, we, yeah. we enable good conversations. We enable the gathering of data. We propagate that data back to the organization so they can make their own informed decision making so you know ai will just accelerate that in a lot of ways i don't see us as being too far off where somebody is conversing with an enterprise architecture system directly through something conversational and then you know mm -hmm. there's always going to be limitations of that approach there's always the value to the the creativity that ai just can't you know bring into the picture at least not yet and hopefully not for the foreseeable yeah. future but you know the what if kind of questions you know if we did this you know where do where do we go from here kind of thing yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's exactly right. Um, I was going to make one last point. I, anyway, um, James, thank you so much for, for taking the time and for sharing your journey with us. I think we sadly have to come to a close. Um, I hope everyone who's watching uh, found this informative and, and uh, feel free to write in any additional questions and we'll do our best to share them with James and, and, and answer them on the event page. Um, so Absolutely. yeah, James, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Um, before yeah. we hop off, I want to give a quick plug um, for uh, our Amplify webinar, which is coming up on February 28th, 9 a.m. You can just go to our website, rdoc.com, and, and sign up. Um, yeah, it'll also be uh, in the event page below. But, James, any, any parting words for us? 
No, no, I think at this stage, I just want to say thank you, Griffin. I think it's been a great conversation. And I did see a few questions fly by in the chat that I don't think we tackled. So, um, you know, I'll look for you to collect those up. I'm happy to answer those. And if people have any, any kind of follow ups, I'm happy to engage directly. And happy to share anything in our experience that's of value to people. Always an open book, James. Thanks so much. Uh, have a good yeah, rest of your day. We'll, uh, we'll chat soon. Yeah, yeah, take care.